who got up really, really, who got up really, really early. And uh, as you've just seen, we record the first part uh, of this meeting. Uh, we have uh, the microphones switched off for the audience, uh, uh, but we will later sort of give chances to ask questions. This is more because we had some issues with uh, people in Zoom, but uh, feel free to put questions in at any time into the chat. We'll uh, pick up on them. The meeting, uh, as I said, will be recorded. And with uh, much further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Mark Billinghurst. Uh, I've earlier tried to reconstruct, I think I met Mark the first time in 1998 in Seattle, there was the CSEW conference and we visited the lab of Susan Wakehurst uh, and she was doing really amazing AR stuff in her group. And Mark was one of the people uh, yeah, showing demonstrators. And at that time, now over 20 years ago, I was really blown away. Uh, the marker stuff, I haven't seen it before. The display stuff, I haven't seen before. And I really believe this is going to really change in the next five years, how we interact with computers. I was really excited. We also did then some work in Karlsruhe. Uh, it, I, it was so inspiring to get some stuff done. We got a Sony Glastron for the old uh, people in the audience, uh, the device. So, and, I was really convinced that this is going to change how we uh, interact with computers. But I think now we are 20 years down the road. The big thing in AR was Pokemon Go. Uh, Mark, what has not happened that AR didn't really take over? Oh, well, I think um, there's a couple of things. So first, since you first met me, of course, um, the huge, uh, dominance in AR has been really the mobile AR on mobile phones. As you said, Pokemon Go. I think Pokemon Go is one of the fastest apps ever to get half a billion dollars in revenue. Um, although it's not really a true AR app, but um, with, you know, to have a true AR experience, you really need a head mounted um, display. And as, as you know, as you've mentioned, um, the numbers of uh, see-through or, or AR displays um, have not been uh, huge. Um, I think there's probably several reasons for that. One has been the um, the cost of the displays, and um, uh, it's actually a lot more difficult to build good AR displays compared to VR displays. And then the use cases have not come so much as well. Although we're seeing a, 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 now with the uh, Microsoft HoloLens 2, we're seeing a rise more in um, the AR applications, especially industry. And the applications that we're really interested in our lab is on remote collaboration. And, you know, we were showing things when you came 20 years ago to the lab um, where you could have a remote expert see somebody's uh, real world and make annotations on that. Those are now becoming commercially available. So Microsoft has released software that does it on the whole lens and other people have as well. So I think you, you'll start to see a lot more use of AR in the COVID times and especially with collaboration. But yes, it's, it's surprising to me it's taken so long. I think um, the, the cost has largely um, driven that. Um, and it was also surprising to me to see the huge uptake in the, um, the mobile um, space. I didn't anticipate that would have phones that were so powerful. So I think now people are saying that there's more than a billion and a half phones in the world that are powerful enough to run, run AR experiences in, in the mobile um, and AR. So in, in one sense, you've had a, a big success with mobile. And in the second sense, it's, it's taken a lot longer than expected with the um, head mounted. But the predictions are that in the next five to 10 years, the number of AR users in the world will overtake the number of VR users. So we'll have to see if those are correct or not. So, so I think coming back to what, what it made, what makes AR so attractive in my view is really this placement in space. I think if you look around your room you're in now, a lot of the things how you operate is based on space. And I think I'm in a crowded basement room uh, with a lot of stuff around. And I think uh, I know where the things are and I know it by space. I, I have a spatial reference. And I think uh, this would have been possible with uh, basically mobile phones for quite a while. Again, this is, I think it's a very powerful concept. And I think, again, looking back in the end 19s where you looked into uh, interactive uh, or people-to-people -people communication with uh, AR. So we haven't seen that people really, uh, yeah, use the power of space 
for uh, interaction. And I think if you look at desktop machines, it's, it's, it's not there very much. I think the desktop a little bit, but the use of space, where is sort of the, the research, where is the research stuck? We know psychologically space is extremely powerful, but still we haven't really found the concepts to really make them uh, usable. Yes, well, I think, I think um, you'll start seeing that happening in the next uh, few years because um, now we have the ability to um, capture, to scan and capture space, you know, th things like the, the whole lens and the Magic Leap displays and then even the VR displays like Oculus Quest, they have outward facing cameras and they can scan the surroundings um, and use them to build a 3D model of the environment. Of course, they use that for tracking now, but you'll see more use of these kind of blended reality or mixed reality experiences where um, you can incorporate elements of the real world, um, the geometry of the real world into the AR scene as, as well. And that produces a much more realistic um, um, uh, AR experience too. So it really has only been in the last three to four years that you've had the ability to um, scan the environment and, and, and track from that. And of course, that same ability is now coming to mobile handheld devices, um, Microsoft, oh, sorry, Apple with the um, the LiDAR uh, scanners they're putting into um, their iPads and iPhones will introduce that um, as, as well. And that leads us towards um, very large scale um, space capture representation uh, with using the AR cloud. So companies like Niantic that of course produced Pokemon Go they are now, they, this year they acquired the company 6D.ai and that's a company that specializes in uh, capturing uh, geometry from the real world and storing it in the cloud. So now with that company's technology, they can produce large scale um, scans of cities and other places from crowdsourced uh, cameras from people's on, on their phone. So I think you'll see a lot more uh, inc incorporation of space into the, into the applications in the real world. Um, over the next a few years. So it's, it's coming, I would say. Okay, shall we talk about, uh, yeah, like uh, empathic computing. Um, Mark, uh, your current position, or you have currently two positions, but in Adelaide, you have the um, empathy computing lab. And maybe you can briefly tell us what empathic computing means, and then probably also what can we win, um, like, and between people like empathy um, can allow for emotion. Maybe we can a bit talk about what empathy can bring to us in terms of uh, physically connect to people, um, attending theater, etc. all that stuff that is um, barely possible these days. Sure, so, so, you, so, so I have a lab, actually the Empathic Computing Lab is both in Adelaide and at the University of Auckland. I'm um, spending time between um, both um, locations. And really empathic computing is about um, trying to increase collaboration with other people. So the, the, the focus or the aim of empathic computing is exploring if we can develop systems that allow us to share what we're seeing, hearing, and especially feeling with other people. And that's, that's kind of arisen because of three technology trends that are happening in the, in the uh, telecommunications and HCI space. One is the trend towards more natural and richer collaboration really off the back of very high bandwidth networking. So if you can now share um, subtle nonverbal cues and gesture cues, things like this one. The second is trend is towards experience capture where you've got technology like we just talked about that, that you capture your surroundings both in 360 or 3D and share that. And then you've got this trend towards implicit understanding where you've got machines that can watch you and understand your emotions or your um, what you're doing. And when those three, three things combine together, that's where empathic computing sits. So it's really about trying to build systems that enable collaboration, but, but not just to see the other person's face, but to see what their environment is, and especially to, to some extent, understand what they're feeling and share those feelings with other people. So hopefully it'll allow us to create new types of collaborative experiences where we look through the eyes of another person, or we can um, see how, how stressed they are or what emotions they're feeling um, when they are collaborating with us. So towards quite different collaboration. 
And I guess um, the term of co-presence is highly, like, you know, highly related to that. And usually presence and co-presence increase if we have more modalities or more information on different modalities. And as we know, um, current AR and VR is um, mostly about vision. What about like audio or even more exotic modalities? Will this be a next step? Will this be a good step? Yes, well, actually for, um, in the studies we've done, actually going back 20 years to when Albrecht came to visit us, um, the audio is very, very important. So we did some studies looking at um, remote collaboration and we found that under low bandwidth situations, you um, could drop the frame rate to save the bandwidth, but you had to make sure you preserved the audio. And so if you provide a very good audio experience and then after that, we did studies on spatial audio. So if you provide a spatial audio experience, that significantly enhances that feeling of co-presence that you were talking about. And so I think um, it's important to share the visuals. It's also important to have a very good audio experience. And then of course, other people are doing research on how you can share other sensations as well. So um, a sense of touch, for example, um, some people have done some research on how you can um, share different tactile um, experiences. We, we've done work on representing emotion in different ways. So you can share the heart rate of one person to the other. Um, and you can, through that, understand how the other person is, is feeling. So if you can create a rich um, multi-sensory experience, that will inc increase the experience of co-presence, as you're saying. And in the, actually, with empathic computing, the goal is more towards tele-existence where you feel like you're actually in the other person's environment and so if you can capture some of the um, sensations in that environment share it that'll increase that feeling yeah so I, I think there was a question in the in the chat and i think that that you you use two terms you use basically the uh, the telepresence uh and the co-presence and the question uh, is basically can we define those terms and obviously i think something like co-presence is even in the Oxford reference. I put just, a, I think I, I put it in there, but what is in your view, what is sort of the, the difference between really this idea of co-presence or telepresence? And I think telepresence was very en vogue in the nineties. And then I think over the last few years, we have seen telepresence robots, uh, which basically take us into a different, basically take us on the in the output space of being present. Can you sort of your own, not necessarily definitions, but sort of what these terms mean for you? Yes, yeah, so, so certainly telepresence is about being in somebody else's um, location uh, to some extent. So as Albrecht said, there's been a lot of work done um, initially in Japan where you'd have a robot in a real location and the robot had cameras and microphones and so through a head mount display, you would feel like you're at the robot's location. In fact, there's a company now called Teleexistence, which um, a Japanese company, which does exactly that. They sell robots or provide robots that give that experience. The co-presence is about feeling like you're together in the same space, but it may not necessarily be the remote person space for it. So for example, if you are together in a, um, in a VR environment, um, which is separate from your uh, real space, you, you may have two people or more than two people that come together in the VR environment, um, then you would feel co-present in that environment. But that environment is very different from either any of ours real space. Whereas tele-existence tries to um, get you to um, feel like you're in somebody else's uh, real space. And to some extent, um, with what you're doing with the robot and some of the work we've been doing also with sharing uh, camera views, you can actually feel like you're inside somebody else's body and you, you can see, see the world from their perspective. Whereas with co-presence, you very much still um, feel like you've got your own body, but you're in together in a, in a third space with somebody else, if that makes sense. I just put the link in, you referred to uh, the Teleexistence, the, the Japanese company, I, I think I got the right one. Uh, and I think there's uh, this link to. I can put the link to actually the company website. In, okay. Um, yeah. And, and I think there is this uh, link to uh, social VR, basically in the virtual space, which we have next week. Uh, Eva Wolfangel talking. I think she's also in the audience. So I think I would move on with uh, 
uh, basically the question about sort of does, I think the assumption already in naming your lab is that we can create empathy by higher fidelity uh, presence or basically co-presence, telepresence. And my question is, is it really an implication that we create empathy through that with the empathic computing or could it be sort of not making the distance between people even greater because we have a better experience in being distant? So I think at the moment, a lot of us are longing for real meetings because the experience we have with something like Zoom is really not very good. The question for me is, is sort of, is it definitely that we get empathy through these channels or may there be something missing? What, what is your take on that? Um, well, sorry, let me just... Um... More I'm trying to find the tele existence video actually. I'm just, I'll share the video in the um, link um, as, as well. Um, so um, I think um, empathy is kind of a very complicated uh, topic. In fact, we had a very interesting uh, a talk from a researcher to our lab yesterday from psychology. He talked about the neuroscience of empathy. Um, so I think there are a number of different aspects that fit into empathy. One is being able to um, perceive the world from somebody else's perspective. And so a lot of what we do in our lab is, is we, um, we can um, help share that uh, physical or that, that um, uh, virtual view of somebody else's environment. Um, but empathy is also a, a mental um, state as well. So for example, if I, I had an experience of um, being in a car crash, and if somebody else tells me, or oh, they were had been in a car crash, then um, I might be able to empathise more with that because even though you know I'm not physically seeing a car crash at the same time as them because I had that experience in the past, I can then recall that experience. So there are many factors that comprise empathy, both from um, having shared experiences to be able to perceive somebody else's state, um, to be able to um, to some extent feel what they're feeling as as well. So all of those things together combine to create empathy and so it's in our lab certainly that's what we're trying to do is, is um, create um, uh, the view of somebody else's experience but one of my PhD students is actually in, in Germany now um, with you Cornell he's looking at how if you have um, shared experiences in the past you know if, if you've had people that both had car accidents or people who have both women have both given birth for example then that make may make it much easier to create or a shared emotional experience or recall those emotions from that experience. So um, I think uh, a lot of research can be done on how you can uh, recreate that psychological experience based on people's um, contextual cues and also their memories as, as well. And then through that, create that empathy experience. Uh, it's partly a neurological state as well. So we have these mirror neurons that activate when somebody does something that um, triggers a recall in your mind as well. And that um, activation can then also help feel that empathy as well. So I think there's the question, who is the student? And I'm pretty proud that he's, he's uh, visiting our lab. And I think he managed now, we haven't met physically yet. He's also in the call, uh, Kunal. Uh, and I think he just switched the video on. He will be later around as well. So, and if you are in Munich, uh, uh, yeah, uh, meet him. If you're in the Munich lab, meet him. Uh, he will be around there uh, for a while. So that's yes, uh, for in, curiosity. In, in, but now, Katrin, uh, to, the, to the next question. Katrin, does it work? Uh, I, I had, uh, I lost connection. You have to okay, so, so let's do, I do another one and then, then, yeah, then we switch yeah. back, back to you, sorry. Okay, so uh, I think you had this idea of uh, the empathy question. One thing you did over the last years is basically uh, sharing a heartbeat of people, which mm -hmm. is sort of a very sort of intimate thing. Can you talk a little bit about the project? What what did motivate you to do that? Perhaps if people haven't seen it, what, what did you do and, and what is sort of the hypothesis behind the experiment? So we did a couple of experiments, but um, one of our goals um, is to be able to live stream the um, surroundings of a person with somebody else. And we had the hypothesis that um, in addition to 
sharing the view and the audio of somebody else, if we could share some of their physiological states. So, you know, if, if a person was mountain biking down the side of a mountain and we could um, share their heart uh, rate to somebody else, then that other person might feel more excited because they could just hear the heartbeat. But it's, it's quite difficult to build that for real in, in the real world. So we decided, well, um, until we could build it for real, let's build a VR experience where you could, um, because it's VR, you could put yourself inside somebody else's virtual body. And again, you could you could share those physiological cues with the other person. And so we, we built that. We had a person inside VR who was uh, playing a game. And then we had a second person in VR whose virtual body was put in the same uh, location as the first person. And um, as, as that person um, moves through the VR, then the other person would move with them. Um, and then we measured the heart rate of the person playing the game and we shared it back with the remote person. And we found that um, when we did that, the remote person found a lot more um, uh, connection. There's a, a, an effect scale and they felt a lot more positive effect. What we also discovered though was, um, well, a couple of things. One was how to represent the heart rate. So initially we had a icon on the screen of a heart that was beating and the other person would see the icon and they would also hear the heartbeat. But the users said they didn't like that very much. And so we did a follow on experiment where we um, took away the beating icon, just left the sound. And also in VR, you know, we had the VR controller, we could pulse the VR controller with a, a vibration. And feeling that um, hearing the sound of a heartbeat plus feeling the vibration, it made people uh, feel more connected. We also found that we could artificially increase the heart rate. So if somebody is playing VR and maybe they were not so excited, we could increase their heart rate by 15 or 20 percent and send that to the remote person and the remote person would start feeling that they were much more excited and their own heart rate would increase um, as, as well. So that's that's uh, one example of how you can use physiological cues to modify the physiological cues of another person. Heart rate is just one thing, of course. We, we can also look at things like um, measuring your um, emotional state, so your level of excitement, um, um, your, your facial expression, um, your, your GSR, your level of sweating, um, and, and then the big research challenge is how to grip that to some, somebody else. So we did some early research with measuring um, the face expression, and then on the other person's side, we just have a, a, an icon that, or a emoticon that changed depending on the face, but that's not um, so good. And then we did some other research on you know, maybe changing the colors of a representation, but there's a lot of research we still have to do in that um, state. And in fact, in the long term, you could we're not we're not doing this right now, but but some people have done work where they can actively um, using uh, TMS systems, they can put a magnet on the brain, and they can uh, stimulate portions of the brain that actually cause people to feel different emotions. So you could imagine, you know, if you could recognize an emotional state for one person, you may be able to cause some brain activation on another person and actually make them feel that same emotion, whether it's anger or depression or happiness or whatever else, but that's far in the future, but that's something that could be done potentially in 10, 15, 20 years. I'm thinking about, um, so I, I have the feeling there's also a, a case for too much information. Like um, I talked uh, to Igor Zawa, who we will have uh, in a few weeks and he does surgery. And uh, he said like in a, in a surgery room, you sometimes avoid, you know, like uh, the translation of smell. And I guess maybe breath or smell could be information that are disturbing in some, at least some use cases like, you know, collaborative work, for example. Did you investigate like uh, such, I don't know, <laughs> research questions like which information may not help for empathy? Oh, no, we haven't done that, but you're right. You could have too much. Um, and there has been some other work being done on sharing um, multiple um, cues, you know, sh sharing the GSR and the heart rate. And, so, and, and, it, and some researchers have found that um, really you don't need to share all that information. Just sharing the heart rate or, or by itself is enough because the extra other cues don't add much uh, value. Um, but I think there's definitely an issue with potential information overload. Also, um, you know, just sharing that information uh, doesn't help that much unless you provide some interpretation of that um, 
as well. So you, you could, for example, have a, a screen full of um, phys, uh, phys, uh, physiometric information. So you have some lines representing the heart rate or um, GSR or things like that. But if the person can't interpret that, then that doesn't really um, increase the feeling of empathy very much. Mm -hmm. And I should mention also that this sounds a little bit, um, um, you know, uh, a research question or a lot of research, but actually devices are coming on the market now that will make it very, very easy. So um, HP are about to release the HP Omni set, set head mount display. And um, this one is a head mounted display that will allow you to measure a lot of uh, physiological uh, data. Uh, they can measure the eye gaze, for example, the pupillometry, so your pupil dilation, the um, uh, the um, heart rate information, and they also have a face camera, so they can measure your face expression while you're inside VR. So I'll, I'll put this into the um, I'll put this into the chat window. Mm -hmm. But with devices like this, it's going to become very easily to to measure emotional state from inside uh, VR and create very rich um shared emotional experiences by that so i think you'll see you'll start seeing a lot more um emotion heavy um based vr experiences i have a follow-up on the too much information question like uh, greta thunberg says uh, she has uh, asperger and lacks a bit empathy and that allows her to you know be more brave in terms of sharing her opinion um, mm, yeah. You know, like I'm, I'm really, I'm wondering if we can probably smartly select information that we, you know, share with others for collaborative work, for telecommunication. Um, you know, like I think um, the the immersion theory, like um, more is better somehow. Not only because of cognitive load, but also I think it can stand uh, like you know between people. Um, yes, and I, I think, um, well, that, that's one of the interesting things about, um, uh, one of the interesting things about um, using VR is that you can selectively decide what you want to share with the other person. Um, and so you, you can um, modulate all of the sensory information coming in and, you know, um, increase the amount of, you know, heart rate you're sharing or dial down the visual sensors. And that allows us to, um, it, it, uh, allows us to explore what the effect of each of those um, modalities are on the um, user's um, emotions. One of the things that we're doing right now, which is uh, very interesting, is um, looking at brain synchronization. So it turns out when you have uh, two people, uh, well, about 10 years ago or 15 years ago, people discovered that if you have two people in the real world doing a physical task, if you measured their brain activity, sometimes the phase of the brain waves um, would come in sync. And when that happens, um, you can have this brain synchronization and that people feel a lot more connected and um, they sometimes get that flow state you hear about in um, psychology. So just this year, we did a similar experiment to that, but it was the first time people had done the same experiment inside VR. And we found also that we could um, reproduce the same effect. But the interesting thing with VR is, of course, you can change the perspective. And so we could put one person inside the body of another person inside VR. And now you have exactly the same perceptual cues as the other person. And then we could measure brain synchronization again. And we found that that um, increased and, and it happened in, in different um, brain wave uh, frequencies than what happens in the real world. So it, it shows basically that um, using uh, VR experiences allows you to perform experiments you couldn't do in the real world because you can then uh, selectively reduce or modify the, the perceptual, um, um, what we're seeing perceptually, or you can, um, you, you can um, um, allow people to um, perceptually things, see, things they, see things they wouldn't be able to do in the real world. I, I think you brought up the devices and technologies. One of the questions I have on my list is, if I wanna basically start exploring that space, if I'm sort of new to that space as a PhD student or researcher or just basically also switching directions, what would be sort of your hello world example of creating an empathic computing system? What is, if I have an afternoon or two 
uh, and I wouldn't want to implement something to try sort of this experience. What would you recommend me to to build? Well, the, the one of the easiest things to build would be the shared VR experience. I was well, there's a couple of things. So one very easy one is the the shared VR experience I was telling you about, because then you can um, easily control what the other person is seeing, and then you can easily. It's very easy to capture and share heart rate using a simple heart rate monitor. But another very easy experience to do is, uh, or relatively easy, is to combine a um, 360 video camera with a VR headset. And so you can live stream video from one person to another person in a VR headset. And that creates a very strong sense of shared presence with the other person. They feel like they're standing in your real um, body. And again, if you combine that with some physiological sensing, or you know, if you have some eye tracking and you compare the, combine the eye gaze, that also creates um, that experience. Uh, there's a company, um, not a company, an, an art uh, collective that um, did a lot of exploration on shared um, shared uh, gaze, and they um, developed an art project called the Machine to Be Another. And um, the Machine to Be Another uh, takes camera views, and, and actually we did this a long time ago, about the time that Albrecht was doing it, but not as well as what they did. But it, it has two people in VR headsets that have video see-through VRs to have cameras on the outside of the VR headset. Um, but instead of sending the camera to yourself, they send it to the other person. And what that means is that you get the feeling that you're, you're in some, somebody else's body. And I'll just share the link on the um, chat here. Um, it's actually very easy to do from a technical perspective. Um, you just take the camera view from one person, the stereo camera view, and, and you send it through to the other person's headset. Um, and they, when they did this, they created a very interesting experience. For example, um, in one case, they had a, a woman who was in a, a wheelchair, and they swapped the camera view from her perspective to a dancer. And so she felt for the first time in years that she could now move and dance in space. They had also gender swapping where, you know, you would put the headset on and you'd look down. And if you're a male, you'd see a woman's body um, below you. And if you're a female, you'd see a man's body. Or they looked at race um, swapping. And um, so this is a very easy way to create that um, a feeling that you were um, in, in somebody else's embodiment. So there are a number of uh, very simple experiments you do like that. These types of things could easily be done in just a few days. OK, so I think we have some questions coming in. And they are too long to read. So my, my suggestion would be we stop the recording here. And then uh, Stephen would first uh, put uh, Lewis on and then uh